This conference will now be recorded. All yours, Regina. Okay, so here recently I had a conversation um, with a relative and you guys know that I have been sick for like the last two years and I started getting sick back in 2018. Well, um, I, it came to light that I probably had COVID-19 already back in 2018. After my cousin started talking to me about his symptoms, then I got to thinking about the symptoms I had when I first got sick and I first got my SARC flare because we thought it was a flare. And I had the dry cough, I had the chest pains, I had every freaking doggone thing that there was that they're talking about. And I remember now because my pops had the same exact symptoms and we would call on the, on the phone and talk with each other about the symptoms, the same symptoms. Well, needless to say, he passed away and I was still sick and I struggled. And I think I'm, and I think I struggled all the way until just what mm -hmm. last year. And then I went into, um, into some other issues and then they were SARC related. But I'm telling you what, I believe I had COVID-19 back in March and April of 2018. What do you guys think of that? Because I have a brother who, who said that they also had it and they're pretty sure it was back in November of 2019, if not even before then. So this condition or disease has been out for a couple of years. They just didn't have a name for it. And I remember because they, the doctor told me, well, you should have been in the hospital because of all these different symptoms and they couldn't tell what I had. I had an upper respiratory system, um, something upper respiratory. They couldn't figure what, out what it was. It was flu-like. Um, they gave me the Teflon pearls because I had the dry cough. That didn't work. I kept going back and forth to the doctor. Nothing they did for me, not even the antibiotics, nothing worked. And I was already on all the medications, you know, that they had already talked about that's already out there. The Plaquenil, you know, the hydrochloroquine. And I was already on all that. So I'm telling you, I think it was already out a couple of years ago. And it took me a long time to start feeling better. I'm I wonder, still, but. I wonder though, if you, um, if you could get an antibody test. Well, that's what somebody else was saying that I probably could get that um, antibody test. Because but will my insurance pay for it? Because hmm. I heard of other people who feel that they had it before when this has, you know, technically started, but antibody tests will, will help clarify that. But it would be really interesting because I'm sure if it is, then it's obviously you got it from somebody. So it was around beforehand. Mm -hmm. I would the only say, way to tell, I, I think, is going to be the antibody test. Yeah, our state is paying for the antibody test. Huh? <laughs> I said our state is paying for the antibody test. Really? Yep. But did they just recently? Come to New York and get it. <laughs> Anyone well, that wants it in our state can get it. But didn't didn't they also state that the antibody test for some people seems like a, a life of two months? And then you may not have the antibodies any longer. I thought that was the new thing from Dr. Fauci. Oh, I hadn't heard that, but that mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's yeah. not true. <laughs> now, nowadays, <laughs> I have no clue what's going on anymore. Me I've either. Been, I've been staying away from the news. It's just annoying. <laughs> we need to get Dr. Fauci on here, okay? <laughs> yeah, because I'm sure he's not busy or anything. There's too many similarities with our disease yeah. and COVID. So, Wendy, we'll put you in charge of making that happen. <laughs> well. <laughs> so, I have um, three things 
I want to bring up. Call them public service announcements, whatever you want, because they are work related. Um, one is the burden study has come out and I forwarded, I posted it on my Facebook page. I'll put it on this group link. Um, everybody fill it out. It is, a, it'll, it takes about 45 minutes because they want really good information. They want, you know, it, it's basically checking about how much rare disease costs. So the more people to fill it out, the better. So just like, it takes about 45 minutes just so you're mentally prepared. So that was one. Oh, another one is we have coming up soon inside Scoop, we have a scholarship coming out uh, for rare disease patients. So, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's just for um, young kids. It's for anybody going to school. So, yes, I thought I'm here, Regina. <laughs> <laughs> so, by all means, as soon as that comes out and goes completely live, I'll forward that information, forward it on to anybody you want, anybody who has a rare disease. And this is going to go on for about five years, but this year the windows for um, applying and getting it is really tight just because of all the delays. So, Theoretically, it might be easier to get it this year than it would others. So I'm telling you all. And then the third thing is we are looking for, um, if I'll post a link to one of our newsletters, but we're looking for what they're calling um, like a, a one minute video from people to submit. That would be basically kind of quickly tell your story about your rare disease and how that advocacy has played a role in it whether it started you or you were able to do something but a one minute video if anybody would like to be featured in our newsletter which of course i'm pushing for sarcoidosis but you know so if anybody wants to submit something please please do one minute say who you are what you got and something connected to advocacy I got, yeah, I, that today. Yes. I got a question for you, Mary. I got that um, burden study in my email today. Excellent. Oh, the, got, okay. So I kind of looked at it and I have a question because sarcoid, sarcoidosis isn't considered a rare disease because it's not in that list that we have to mark other. Yeah. Okay. It's not a Okay, because I not on that list. <laughs> I was one of the sample ones when we were making it, and all the suggestions I made, I suggested that we add that one, and I guess it didn't take because I haven't looked at what went out today. No, nope, it's not on that, and it's never on any of the lists that I've done so far. So I was just curious. Now that's interesting because I did put that down, so I know I gotta talk. I'm gonna give somebody a little flack, not that they can change it, but just, yeah. That's why everybody fill it out. So they'll be like, whoa, look at all these sarcoid people. We need to like <laughs> listen to them. So yeah, do other in somewhere in the notes, right? Sarcoidosis. Yeah, I was looking at it actually today. And that, yeah, that's the first thing I was like, hey, it doesn't have sarcoid in there. Surprise. Oh. <laughs> Well, you, but you want to know something? A lot of the um, surveys that come out do not have sarcoid yeah. on it at all. Yeah. And not just, I mean, just any place you get, you do the survey and you don't, they don't have sarcoid on there. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a, a problem that we're having nowadays is that our numbers are over 200,000. So it's, uh, we're really getting a lot of uh flack are we really a rare disease now or are we not uh so but i think what could happen and you know this it's a matter of looking at it is if you divide up the different types of sarcoidosis because well, there, there's like all kinds of diseases that have have broken themselves down into parts so we could have cardiac sarc we could have pulmonary sarc we could have neurological sarc so maybe well, that as would... of right now what they're doing i know 
from speaking with NIH is that they're counting us because they're counting by the chronic cases, not by how many cases. Um, so, of they course, our chronic cases were definitely under 200,000. <clears throat> Oh, so, so that criteria would still keep it that way. Okay, yeah, well, well ho hopefully it stays that way, you know, you know how everything changes in the NIH and everywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> when it, when no, anything it, has to do with government, it always can change. Yes, and then it takes forever. For <laughs> yeah, it could change. You know, it's funny to get us off the list. It, it's like that. But to get us back <laughs> on the list, it takes us years. <laughs> yes. A lot of fun. Hey, Dan, how you doing? Good guys, how are you? All right. Good. So, um, yeah, the I got yeah I got a couple of things from you guys today. So, <laughs> from every life and our daily. So, yeah, we had a lot going on today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of community <laughs> congress things and stuff like yeah. that. So yeah, you guys are definitely busy. Um. We have a couple of things. I'm just going to give a little bit of a rundown. Uh, Trina's involved in this with me. Right, Trina? <laughs> uh, Trina, Trina, myself, Chester, and Rodney. We are going to be working on a, uh, we're still working on it. Uh, just so you know, I got an email from the person that I've been dealing with, is Valerie Cartwright, uh, just tonight. Uh, I'm gonna have to talk to her tomorrow. We are going to have well. This month is actually Minority Mental Health Awareness Month, so this actually goes in with our project that we were working on. Anyway, um, we are actually gonna have a project for uh, minorities, people of color. We're gonna have um, doctors, uh, psychiatrists, government officials, since. Sarcoidosis, the majority of sarcoidosis patients in the United States are black women and black men. Uh, and with all the stress that is going on with the world right now, and uh, that they can't, uh, like some people want to protest, they can't because of COVID. And it's just been a very stressful time for minorities. We're actually going to have a um, round table with um, a bunch of uh, people from Black Lives Matter, from hopefully from the NAACP, right, Trina? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, who, who else am I thinking of? Uh, we're gonna I'm have, working on that. <laughs> we have government officials. We actually have people from the Bernie Mac Foundation that's gonna be involved in it. Um, we are, like my, um, my, Brookhaven Town Council member. Her name is Valerie Cartwright. She's been to every one of my events. Uh, she's been really behind Sarkados of Long Island since day one. I've known her. I've known her ten years. Um, I knew her before she became a um, council member, and she's actually a civil rights attorney. So um, she's been during the COVID times when COVID started, when the town hall closed. They, she was doing every every day at 12 o'clock on Zoom and Facebook, she was having meetings about COVID, talking to um, doctors, nurses, essential workers, just trying to get everybody together and listening. And it was really popular. And then when the whole thing happened with Black Lives Matter and with George Floyd, um, she started to work on having that. And she had some amazing shows. Um, she had one of the shows was actually kids from eight to 12 to discuss about Black Lives Matter. And let me tell you, that thing was actually more in informative than uh, probably more of the adult ones that I've seen. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so, um, and then she went to different age groups and had them all talk about how it affects them, uh, both mentally and physically and emotionally. So when I brought it up to her about how it does affect um, a lot, you know, like I said, because sarcoidosis is um, is un unfortunately um, black men and women and people of color, and a lot of people were upset because they couldn't do anything and they couldn't, they felt like they couldn't a protest or they felt like 
they didn't have a, a say. So these the people that we're getting are actually going to talk about different ways to handle it, um, handle the stress, and also if they want to get involved, there are different ways to get involved um, that you don't have to be there physically to get involved. And so they're going to talk about that. Um, and like I said, they're gonna, we're going to have some doctors. Actually, one of my county legislators is he wants to join in. His mother passed away from sarcoidosis. He's also a doctor. He became a doctor because his mom passed away from sarcoidosis. He's an um, ophthalmologist and he works with sarcoidosis cases uh, for, op for the eyes. Uh, but yeah, he's going to be involved and we have a bunch of other doctors and we're working on a lot of other different people. So I just want to kind of let you guys know, we don't have an exact date yet. I'm hoping to have that real soon, but uh, I think it's something that is needed for the community. And then we're going to, I mean, we're going to work off of that and try to do some other things for the community to get to really work on making sure the community, because I've been hearing a lot of things, especially on Facebook about stress levels. And I know this is a great, you know, little thing for stress, but I think we need to get more people involved, uh, doctors, psychiatrists, and stuff like that. Um, Rodney actually had the doctor who spoke here, Dr. Sakatu, she's going to, um, she wants to be involved a little bit more in that and trying to help patients um, try to, you know, answer some questions. So she's going to be uh, helping us a lot in the near future also. So we do have a lot of things going on. Hopefully I can cut by, by the next meeting, we definitely have more um, a clear cut answers on when are we going to do these things. But I really think it's something that is needed. People have been stressed and, uh, and like I told a lot of people that I've been talking to, for normal people, stress is just stress. But for sarcoidosis patients, stress kills. So, um, so there's a big difference, and I, people are starting to learn. So I think that's a great, that'll be a great start at least. So, anybody right. else? Did you want to talk? That, what? Yeah, I was curious about. Um... Do you think this would be something, what you're talking about, would be something for um, Representative um, Gottlieb from New Jersey? Yeah. That's his name, yeah. Yeah, definitely. If, I mean, if you if you know anybody who can contact him, I personally don't have his contact, or if you want to send me the information. Yeah, I might be able to do that. I might be able to okay. contact him. Do you have, um, like, anything, like a one-pager or, or anything like I that? I will tomorrow. I will have it tomorrow. Yeah, send that to me, and then I'll see if I can get in touch with him. And if there's some way okay. that he could be involved, because he wants to help out anyway, and this might mm -hmm. be a good way to connect the sarcoidosis to him, which also he might have some insight on good ways to um, advocate on other things like yes. Black Lives Matter and, and everything that's going on. So he might have some insight on what's yeah, working. That'd be great. That'd okay. be great because I mean, I just want to. Like I said, a lot of people feel helpless. A lot of people are stressed out. Um, so yeah. this is start. This is a start. I think, um, and then we'll, you know, we once we can start. I think, like Trina, uh, I mean, I think once we can start picking out what people, I'm wondering, almost wondering if we should start a uh, maybe make a um, our own little survey and try to find out. What do you think, Trina? Um, <clears throat> just to piggyback off of what was just previously said and discussed, I feel that, and this is just me personally, I'm sorry, moving around here, a lot of movement around the house. I just feel personally that there are so many avenues we can tap into this, Frank. One of the things I was looking at, not just on a BLM matter, but um, this is a civil matter, period. You know, yeah. this is a human rights matter. And I think if we can take it from each avenue, that pretty much we got the cornerstone covered. Um, and we can even do it like a rare perspective. You know what I'm saying? Since we're dealing yes. with rare disease patients. And I, I'm just thinking, you know, the broader it is, but the same kind of vision yes. in that. And what we want to take away from these meetings 
and not just take away, but what course of action is going to actually take place? Who are we going to hold accountable within our jurisdiction mm -hmm. to make sure that whatever the request is or, or asking them to allocate funds is actually going to take place? And mm -hmm. this is not just wasting anybody's time or hearsay, or you just having uh, this discussion because you know the election is about to come up. Yep. We want to make sure, even if the seats change, excuse me, y'all, just a lot of information in the last couple of days. <clears throat> if even with the seats changing, we need something etched in stone for the rare disease community. Yes, I agree. Yes, um, I think that we like what we could, like you say, we could actually make these like uh, more than a one one time thing. We just start you know building it from the the first part of it and then we can keep on moving and taking it to a, a bigger you know like you said have a, a concrete ask have a um and then also like you know like on the mental health aspect of it how you know how is not just the government but how are, are uh, the psychiatrists helping how are the you know how on you know do, how are the doctors helping how are you know that kind of thing yeah, Trina. Well, that should have. Um, Frank, my understanding, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut nobody off. My understanding, um, I believe this is state by state, they are cutting back on mental health funding. So when we have these roundtable discussions, we really need to see how they can pull those resources and serve them for them. So let me just get over there. Oh, I'm surely I can talk to it. Yeah, I think I've got it muted. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Um, I, that's okay. Yeah, so yeah, um, they are cutting funds. They're actually cutting funds for COVID itself, <laughs> for COVID testing. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of funds being cut it cut and telling people just go just go back to work and don't worry about it. So there's a lot of things that we're gonna have to cover. It's not just gonna be. I just think this is a like I said, we can. This will be a tip of an iceberg. And the more, once we find out who we who really want to be involved in this, it'd be something you know we could really work on, and then we could bring in the whole rare disease community. You know. Do you and, think ADA should be involved as well? Because if we're going to try to do self-preservation, I think now is the time. I actually have a call in with ADA um, today. I called in, and they really stepped up once. They they used to be a piece of crap. They um, I talked to. Um, one one person to, today, and I'm actually going to have a conference call with them on Friday. Uh, I the person I talked to really wasn't uh too high on the um on the totem pole, so she wanted to make a conference call, and I got I just got the thing to the, um this evening the conference call invite, so I know it's happening. So yeah, I talked to ADA. I talked to uh. No I actually even talked to American Lung Association, um, so to get them involved. Uh, yeah, I really want to start getting, making it just more than just. So, so at this point, like I said, we're going to start off sarcoidosis, but I really want to make it more than, because it's all over. Um, so, if and we're losing a lot, a lot, especially with the COVID going with COVID going on. We're losing a lot. Um, I know, like in Florida, the the governor said that they are going back to school um, the first week of August or something like that, and you have no choice. Uh, so, I mean, really, you have no choice. Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, I, you know, in New York, will I'm lucky. Uh, Cuomo is not pushing people. Um, as a matter of fact. That from what the three options that they ha they have, the first option, of course, is going. Everybody go back, which, according to Cuomo, is not really an option. The second option, which is probably going to happen, is going to be half, uh, like some like two or three days in at the school, and then the other two days or three days you're going to be at home. So, but not everybody's doing it, and it's kind of scary. I'm like for myself, I don't. My daughter has asthma. 
I have I have multiple <laughs> diseases. Do I really want to send them back to school? And I feel bad for the teachers too. I really do. I mean, nobody's even thinking about the teachers. They get paid not next to nothing, and then you're just putting their lives in danger. I mean, that's crazy. So I mean, so yeah, I think we can we can actually have a a voice in this matter more than just you know just this one meeting that's what i'm hoping for so my son's, uh, my son's that, preschool goes back to school next week uh so yeah, i'm worried about I, that even you know. my wife um teaches preschool and they they were open through this whole thing because um they're part of stony brook university hospital it's it's part of there so they're the people that were necessary workers had to have kids, you know, so that, but my wife took off three months because of me. Um, she, thank God she, it's a state owned, so she had a lot of time left, <laughs> thank God. Uh, but still, you know, she's go, she back full time this week and <laughs> still worried. She's actually more worried than I am, <laughs> but that's the way Diana always is. But yeah, so we're still trying to figure out that part of it. And, yeah, like you said, it's just, it's really scary. They only had five kids in there. Um, but now that we're going to phase four now on Long Island here. So all of a sudden the floodgates are going to start to open up again with all these kids. They have a, they do have a very, very strict guidelines there. Um, no, no parents are allowed in the building. They drop, they, they stop in front of the building. They have a nurse waiting there, taking the temperature of the child and of the parent, even though the parent's not going in. Um, <laughs> and then they have, I mean, everybody has to wear a mask, even uh, like, not the kids, of course, but the, um, all the adults have to wear masks. And uh, I mean, sanitize everything. And yeah, it's, and the separations of the kids now is very, is very strict. But still, it's it's working, uh, right? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> like I said, there's only what it's only Tuesday, and she's only starting, so I don't know yet. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> um, they actually had this... they had one scare earlier on when it first opened, like in March they had a scare. Once they had that scare, that's when my wife was like, "See ya, <laughs> I'm not coming back." <laughs> This could be an excellent time for the BLM stuff, um, for people to take charge and get funding for sarcoidosis. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of funding that will be out there. Actually, Kathleen and I were talking about that today. <laughs> there's a lot of money out there right now. Um, it's just a way you have to ask and how to ask. So it's gonna. Well, think, if you know that, then can you get it for us? All that money, because we need it. it. And it's, it's it's all a matter of like grant writing is one of big things, um, and that's not fun. <laughs> it's not the easiest thing to do. But then the other thing is also um, there are also going to be a lot of people asking for money because, I mean, the summer is a time it, like for us. April was our big time to raise money. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. We need the money, Frank. We need I know, it. But in April, we I raised my organization raised not one penny. <laughs> uh, so it's hard. It was hard. You know, April was our big fundraising month. But um, so we're a lot of. But we're not the only organization. Every organization hey, is. Dying. We don't have anything up here. You got to come up here. <laughs> yeah, that'd be come up here where the money is. <laughs> Um, you gotta come to the colleges. I, I mean, I can't do it. They won't listen to me. <laughs> it's it's tough because even the traveling. That's why I'm staying on Long Island a lot now. It's my traveling. I want. Let me just tell you, you live eight hours of driving away from me at least. <laughs> well, at I, least. I, let me tell you, I might. I I <laughs> I have uh, told some people that um have taught classes and grant writings. You know, my boss, um, who's I'm no longer working for them now, but um, you know, I just gave them a letter that I got because um, I'm trying to get a you know a grant from um, rare diseases, and she's going to look that over, and you know, it brings attention, um, you know, because she's over at Harvard and Boston, they've got another house, and 
you know, those people will look at it and things will start moving because, you know, my old boss is, um, there's two of them, the husband, he's African American and it, and, and he has a lot of pull cause I worked for his father and he was head of civil rights here in Rochester, but I can't do anything myself with doctors, nothing. They don't listen to me. They look at me like I'm a bother to them. There's no, there's no material well, uh, funding. There's nothing for them. It's just, they're selfish. I'm going to be well, honest the with you. They're very selfish. Yeah. But the thing you got to remember is people don't give money, to, uh, um, A, unless you're a 501c3. They, you know, because they're not going to be able to write it off. If like, if you're just a, you could, there's a nonprofit corporation and then there's a 501c3. If you're not a 501c3, they're not going to give you money because you're not, they can't write it off. So yeah, when you're talking about 501c3s, like myself, I'm a 501c3, but if I go up to Rochester and my organization says sarcoidosis of Long Island, you yeah, really think they're going to give money to Long Island and not to somebody up there. So yeah, um, I know, I, I, I know, I understand that, but yeah. maybe you can change your name. No, no, that's not easy. You have to get no, a whole like, new organization. Listen, right. Why yeah, can't but, you have more? Why can't you have an upstate of New York one and a Long Island one? Because you, it costs it costs about two thousand dollars for an organization, three thousand dollars for an organization. You got to be kidding me! Oh no! So how, <laughs> so how do you start Sandy, that? Sandy, do you have an organization? <sighs> no, you don't have one. Okay, I know you work. No, working I with don't. F There's I know you're working with FSR and stuff, but. FSR. Yeah, but I'm not doing much anymore. So um, there is one here in Dallas. Eric Adams, I don't know if you know, he has a, a profit here in Dallas. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, it is it's expensive to open up. I I mean, it takes it takes about three thousand nowadays. Um, because first you have to open up as a corporation. Then you have to now for if you want to work in different states. You have to sign up as a 501c3 for each state that you want to collect money from. Each state that you want to collect money from, you have to pay anywhere from $300 to $900. <laughs> so figure that by 50. <laughs> so that's one thing. Second of all is then that doesn't even count for the, the 501c3 part, which is if you are going to make under ten thousand, it's four hundred and fifty dollars. But if you make, if you're going to make more than ten thousand, it's eight hundred dollars. So, so it get it adds on. It really does. It's not, and especially nowadays, it's going to be really hard for people to do it because they just don't have the finances to do it at this point. So, oh Frank, there's still people with old <laughs> money running around. Uh. All I could say is that hopefully soon there'll be some other sarcoidosis organizations opening up. Um, hopefully real soon. <laughs> well, how can they do, like what you're saying, it's not very positive. How can we open up something? Like, I can't, I, I just found, I, you know, I've been only in this for like six, seven months now. But I've been looking for people from my era. They have sarcoid. It's been so hard. I find people in Syracuse, Buffalo, Albany. I get so excited, but they're not <laughs> close to me. And then I finally, my immunologist, she opened up, to, you know, my rheumatologist. She said, yes, I have two people, two people. And I'm like, we're so excited. Yeah, but. I know I, I should be excited about people having this horrible disease. But I'm, you know, I just think that we really need to get like going on this stuff. And I do think that, that Dan is right. I think that this is a great time because unfortunately it does hit a lot of African-Americans, which my doctor told me that's not true the other day. He said, it's mainly women. And it, uh, the highest num the highest number is African-American women, but then the second highest number is African-American men. <laughs> so, so the African-American population is the highest population for um, sarcoidosis. I read something like uh, somewhere around 2.3% in their lifetime of 
uh, the black community will at some point get sarcoidosis. Or mm -hmm. yeah. And it's weird because in Europe, it's Scandinavians that actually <laughs> the mo uh, that get it in Europe, but you know. Um, but or maybe they're genetically linked up, you know? Like we have this I Irish newscaster, she's blonde, blue eyes, mm -hmm. and she had, she did her genetic link and it came up to Africa. And it's, I mean, if you actually, if Regina, you did your, your um, DNA test, right? <laughs> you find out some really interesting stuff in your DNA test. <laughs> I actually did one, I actually did a genome test a full genome test, excuse me, <clears throat> um, because I actually um, am a patient ad uh, advocate for a company called Illumina, which actually makes the um, genome testing equipment. So they let me have a genome test. And let me tell you, when you get a full genome test, <laughs> you'll never be able to read it yourself, first of all. Um, <laughs> it is, I think, Mine is over, it's 327 pages. Frank, <laughs> yeah. even if it's a small genome like mine, you still can't read it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you actually had to, go, I had to go to a genetic tester. Name? What did it say your heritage was? Uh, I mean, I, but a lot of it I actually knew because we've had a really good, my dad's side really kept, like I, I mean, I had, my dad is, um, indigenous to Puerto Rico. So his family is Indian um, from, from Puerto Rico, but he's also, um, we're also black. And we're also, I, but then on my mom's side, my mom and my grandfather and my grandmother were, all, were both from Ireland and Irish. So mine isn't as, I mean, I had like slim percentages here and there, but for the most part, I was three things. I was Puerto Rican, Hispanic, um, in Indian, and Irish were the three main. And all the rest were like point here, point there, point there, like whatever. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> yeah, it, it's kind of interesting actually to take that test. But if you get a full genome test like I did, you know how much that thing cost? That thing is over, I think it's like five to $8,000 to get a full oh, genome you know, test. Remember how you were talking last time about the genetic testing? They were, you know, moving forward with uh, some stuff. Yeah, that, that's doing? like the 23andMe's and stuff like that. Yeah, they, they're using that. Um, that's cheaper. <laughs> that's a lot cheaper. But it doesn't, it doesn't really give you the full information, like a full genome test. The gen genetic testing they're actually using for um, sarcoidosis patients in um, Austria. They're starting to use it in Austria in one of their clinical trials. So I don't know if I don't know where they are at it right now, but I heard they are actually using it. Because they actually they said they the ones they did chat they did test actually have the same uh it was a like a misformation, but they couldn't actually pick out what gene it was, something like that. I forgot the exact thing, but they haven't, they haven't narrowed down the gene, but that's why a lot of doctors, if you ask them, they'll say it's genetic. <clears throat> and then you hear others that say, no, it's not genetic. Frank, do, do they make you uh, in New York or Long Island, uh, Long Island, excuse me, do they make you show where your funds go that are raised? Oh, every 501c3 has to have everything um a oh, daily well. thing put out yeah that's every 501c3 has to have daily hey, can we have a gofundme account for all of us <laughs> yeah but a lot you know what the problem right. is with GoFundMe, too many people use them and then people don't want to donate to them yeah somebody called me frank this is trina it was um let's just go back to what you just mentioned in regards to the genome testing yeah. you had said something I believe it was you. You had mentioned something on on the lines of um, oh, they finding out a lot of people have sarcoidosis or something to that extent. Did I hear that correctly? I need clarification. They, what they they found out that they did like I think it was like two over two thousand people, and they all had the same mis 
um, the what this one gene that hasn't been classified. We all had the same same problem with that one gene. So is the R? Is, are they looking at the RA? I guess that's, that's how you. Yeah, I I guess that's okay, what they're so, at now. So are we hybrids? No, I'm just teasing. But no, are we <laughs> hybrids? I'm not teasing you now. <laughs> Uh, who knows? We may be. <laughs> I'd say oh, I'm I think we are. Because I'm partially uh, battery operated. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Okay, sorry to interrupt. No, that's all right. But yeah, um, the, it's weird. Hey, Rick, by the way, I, I saw you come in there, sneak in. Um, <laughs> but yeah, from what I've heard, that they've, they've kind of narrowed it down, but they haven't. They haven't named the gene, which I'm surprised that they haven't. And they, um, but they, we all have the same inconsistency. And what that means, I don't know because I'm not a, a genetic expert. <laughs> but it sounds like so, the process, anyway, that they've been able to identify some similarity. So hopefully that just yeah. brings us another step closer to more answers. Yeah, that's it the sounds same. like it's a, maybe a mutation. Yeah, that's the same um, same group that also was able to make the um, animal model. Mm. They were the same only ones that were able to do that at the time. They were the first first to make an animal model in Austria. It's the same group, so mm. I guess they're going somewhere. I guess we all need to move to Austria. Nice. Don't tempt <laughs> me, please. <laughs> I, hear they have great I heard mountains. it didn't exist. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> I heard they have great mountains. It's so in Costa Rica. <laughs> and, and it's nice warmer there, too. Is that somebody in the background here. Sorry, Keisha, I had a uh, mute. Yeah, good. You're getting some sort of background noise. How you doing, Rick? Uh, not bad, except that I just managed to to uh, fall on my ribs on my mountain bike, so I'm a little Ouch. sore right now. I just came back. Ouch. Now, I, everybody is, that's in the room, um, you need you guys need to um, vote for Rick. Uh, on the WeGo Health Awards for Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you, Frank. That's very <laughs> kind of you. And Frank, whilst you're there, Frank has Frank has more awards nominations than I have votes. Let me say. <laughs> what is Rick's last name? Davis. Davis. D A V I S. Oh. Hi, Davis. I'm Davis. I do know Davis to Davis. Oh, right. hey, family. That's right. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, so yeah, that uh that Weagle Health thing, just so you guys know, um some people, thank you, Kathleen, um, and Rick <laughs> and others have nominated myself um uh, for eight awards. Uh it's Rick, I was actually kidding around with it, about it. This is my fifth year nominated. So um, oh, yeah. I consider myself the Susan Lucci. <laughs> 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 but, That's yeah. funny. <laughs> I've been nominated a total of sixteen times now in five years, and I haven't yeah. made—I haven't even been a finalist yet. <laughs> uh, I kid around, so it's actually great to be nominated because We Go Health actually is an amazing organization with a lot—not just rare diseases, but it has many different diseases and. They really want to help, and they do. Um, they have some great. If you ever want to look up there on Facebook, it's We Go Health. Uh, they have a lot of great things going on. Uh, webinars they do. They do training sessions of um, advocating and social media. How social media will help you. Um, it really is, and then really, really good organization, and. So I mean, I really, I, I, for me, they really care. They really do care about everybody that's there. That's one of the things I really like about them. And you could talk to them anytime. I, I mean, 
they I I was actually one I guess it was like two months ago. I was actually um the on Twitter, their Friday Twitter person <laughs> for the whole day. <laughs> they could ask people could ask me questions and the whole deal. But yeah, it was fun. They were a lot of fun. Um yeah, I did, I would agree with Frank. Um, my experience <clears throat> with the people that work there has been always very, very good. I've done a number of um, joint presentations with them in person, actually, and, and on online. Um, you know, for us, um, or for me personally, I, I'm not, I'm nowhere near as good of, as Frank on this promotion side. I mean, <laughs> I, I really have to hand it to him. Um, but the reason why for me it's important to get nominations is because I think it it makes a difference for ANCAN. It, it doesn't make, uh, for me, it would be very nice, but it's incidental, but it makes a huge difference for ANCAN and it makes a big difference for all the groups that are on ANCAN because we get more publicity and then we get more people into our groups. And so I'm... Um, I have to do some self promotion, but I don't like doing it. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, I always, that's one of the things when I, I tell people, it's for me, I don't care if I ever win an award. I kid around about it, but I don't care. My thing is, I would love to see Soccer Dosis win an award. Just yes. win one award. <laughs> We've been yeah. around for a long time. I mean, exactly. I was nominated for RDLA, I was nominated for Global Genes. It was, you know, but just to see Sarkadosis' name get an award would be, you know, would help us so much. You know, we could actually say, you know, we could tell people that, you know, we're, you know, we're recognized by We Go Health, we're recognized by RDLA, Global Genes, whoever it is, and exactly. it really does help. Exactly. I, I mean, I, 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 I totally agree with with Frank on that. So. Um, and, and the way these awards work is that the endorsements count towards being um, named a finalist. But once you're named a finalist, then they have a panel of judges and then the panel of judges decides um, uh, who is going to win. Yeah. So, just and, like I said, it just it really is nice to be nominated, to be recognized. Um, yeah. That's one one thing. But like I said, I really would love to see Sarkadosis' name up there. No, <laughs> it would be so it's cool. Right. And same thing with Ancan. It'd be so cool to see you know having Ancan up there. That you know, it it just gives some sort of you know recognition for the disease itself, <laughs> or, or for the movement itself. Yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. we need a billboard like in all the cities. No, yeah. I actually had the chance to do billboards this year, but nobody's in the city. So why you do a billboard? <laughs> Who am I going to show it off to? Right. Nobody's right. Go, nobody's in the city. They were going right. to give me a really good price. I'm like, yeah, thanks a lot. Nobody's going to see it. <laughs> but um, yes. Yeah, we, we are, um, we, we're actually doing something and we might well consider doing this if you thought it was worthwhile, Nick, but it would be next year for the sarcoidosis community, but we're running webinars, um, they're called The Talk, and oh, they really? are conversations within families about your disease condition. And a lot of times we find, I'm sure you've seen this, that, um, parents uh, rarely talk with their kids about their disease or in a situation like sarcoidosis, it might be the reverse, that kids don't talk with their parents about their disease. When I say kids, I just mean offspring. Mm -hmm. And so what, we've, what we're doing this year is um, three, one on um, prostate cancer, which was last week, which was, Excellent, just fantastic. Uh, one on um, ovarian cancer, and then one on mul mul multiple sclerosis. Um, and next year, we've already got inheritable mutations, which is what you were just talking about, signed mm -hmm. up. 
um, and we'll probably look to do a couple more, more conditions next year. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll have, for example, on the prostate cancer, we had a father and a daughter because the father had passed through a mutation to the daughter that made her more likely to get cancer. So anyway, that's, uh, I'm just mentioning it. Anyway, guys, I have to hop off because I've got, <laughs> got to open another room. But I just really, I, you know, I love to come in and just say hello to everybody. Um, you Thanks guys so are much. a wonderful group. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 But <clears throat> yes, um, there's a lot, a lot of things going on um, that we could. Now, does anybody actually, uh, we didn't actually uh, introduce people today. We kind of just went straight in. Um, did anything, anybody have anything they wanted to say? Wake up, Keisha. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Keisha? I'm okay. Um, I found out yesterday, I have, uh, they found that I don't just have the sarcoid to the lung, but to the pancreas um which has been causing a lot of issues and causing a lot of flares of pancreatitis and they're trying to figure out what to do with me i've lost over 50 pounds in the last year and i've had sarcoid since 2003 well since 2000 i was diagnosed in 2003 last year was the worst year with um it attacked the brain and sent the body into shutdown and since then it's just been more and more diag areas diagnosed with the sarcoids In the beginning i thought i could handle dealing with it but after last year i decided to find some support groups in my area there's not many people with it and I've always been my doctor's youngest, most severe patient. So now I'm kind of reaching out to find other people like me. I'm not sleeping, <laughs> but I, if I sit up, I have this cough from the scope yesterday from when they went into the pancreas. So I was trying not to be coughing. I didn't want anybody to get a COVID scare. <laughs> So just reaching out to find other people like me. Like I said, for years, I thought I had it under control. And now I'm realizing it really controls me. And where do you live? Alone in this big world. So where do you, where live? Do you live? I'm in Wisconsin. Ah, OK. Well, I, I know some people over at Wisconsin that actually have sarcoidosis that maybe I could introduce you to. That would be awesome. I've been the only person I've, like I said, I've been since diagnosed since 03. And when I mentioned it ever, I get this funny stare. <laughs> and the most common question is, is it contagious? Mm -hmm. And I get it. And it's like, no, <laughs> <laughs> but no one never understands that you want to attend or you want to be part of something, but you don't control when you go, it controls you. This is like the hardest disease I've ever had to explain and people don't understand it brings out so many other diseases that you have to learn not just to live with the sarcoid but with your other diagnosis and you don't understand it's hard for you yourself to keep up with the end changes that you can't educate them with the information constantly changing so i thank you for putting the post on facebook whoever shared it <laughs> now uh, i yeah. see that are i'm you, not alone <laughs> are you are you in that support group meeting um facebook page yes okay um uh, see if you could uh message me like to um tomorrow and okay. I'll, I'll send i'll send you some names Thank you so, so yeah. much. This way you can remind me because my brain is all scattered. Yeah, make sure you oh, remind him. You know. <laughs> I'm, <always laughs> doing, I'm doing 20 different things at once, so I, I never know.
<laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Well, it's nice meeting all of you guys. I've been trying to chime in since the beginning of the year. And every time you guys have a meeting, I'm always sick. And today I was like, oh, I feel good. I'm going to be able to make a meeting. So <laughs> Glad you made it. That's great. Yes, yes. So, we, yeah, we, um, yeah, I, I know of, we know, Jen Cash actually lives in Wisconsin. Okay. So, yeah, I'll send a, your, I'll send you her information. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Now, Kathleen, here's a question. Did you co- Go when we first went to um, NIA to a Jen Jenny, and we were on that bus. When that we were on the bus, we the very first time we all went to NIH for um, Rare Disease Day. Uh, there was a whole bunch of people from the rare disease community, and there was about seven of us from sarcoidosis on the one bus. And this one guy goes up, and says, "Uh." you know, ask us who we were, what disease, and then ask us, can I catch it from you? <laughs> and Jenny, Jenny Hinton was like, are you kidding? We can catch more from you than you can ever catch from us. <laughs> you should have coughed on him, Frank. <laughs> he was like so nervous. And then Jenny was like, ah, I'm like, calm down, Jenny. <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of funny. That's like that. When you said that, Keisha, it made me think of that, that you know, everybody else automatically thinks they can catch it from us. I'm like, oh. yeah. <laughs> hey, well, yes. Can't. Yes. And I even put the stop sign on my front door when the COVID outbreak started, and everybody still doesn't seem to understand the, how dangerous the, the COVID is to people with, you know, sarcoid. They just seem to think that sarcoid is just something basic like arthritis or something they don't understand the full concept of what it does to the body yeah um i well you can look at it this way it's not always a death sentence just so you know having covid i had covid so i can honestly say that <laughs> so uh, and i'm still here so i uh, I, to I told my cousin today i said i'm too stubborn and nobody wants me. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. We just need you. <laughs> so, but yeah, so, um, yeah, so any questions you have, you could always, you know, message one of us, uh, you know, and let us know. Uh, there's a lot of people that have been, you know, dealing with this for a while um, in different areas. Uh, you know, like I have it in 90% of my build, uh, but building my body. <laughs> um, yeah, like I always say, I don't have it in my kidneys or liver. And then, we, I mean, this Kathleen has it pretty much the same way. <laughs> she doesn't have it neurologically, right? Is that what it is, Kathleen? Oh, no, I I don't have it in my kidneys or my eyes. Ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> so, yeah. Got it always, everywhere else. There's always somebody to talk to in between this group and in that in that facebook group the good thing about writing in that facebook group is it is a closed group so nobody outside that group can read what you put so you don't have to worry about that and it can't be shared nothing can be shared from that group um so i think that I, i'm, I'm, I'm going to keep it that way now these um these meetings do get recorded but i'm only putting them in that Facebook group page. I'm not putting them out on any other Facebook page or anything like that, just for the same reason. So everybody can, if they have anything to say in this group, you you know, you don't have to worry about it. It stays with the same people. Awesome, awesome. I don't mind sharing my story even if you were ever to need any piece of it. I mm -hmm. feel like there, our stories need to be told. I feel like we're so overlooked and I feel like, you know, our disease is just as important as the other ones that get the mainstream. And yet, you know, we're like that shy kid in the corner that wants to be recognized. That's often forgotten. Well, so, I, I, I was that shy kid, but not anymore. People, anybody you could talk to in this room knows I'm not. <laughs> um, I actually, 
have two books out. One was about me, my autobiography, and the, sec the second one I just put out. Actually, it was really cool. It, it actually got posted on Amazon on my birthday. That was really cool. It was like a cool birthday present. <laughs> but that's about sarcoidosis. Um, and so it's on Amazon, but you could, um, it's, you know, I, uh, same way that you talk about it. I, when I first started, um, I mean, Rodney knows I've been, work, uh, been dealing with Rodney for how long now, Rodney? <laughs> Too long. <laughs> <laughs> a long time since what, 2016? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, but I, yeah, I was diagnosed even before that. Even before yeah, that. I was, and Trina, Trina and I have been around uh, together for a long time now. <laughs> we went, we went down 2015, did a um, spoke in front of co a congressional briefing that Trina set up in 2015. So yeah, so um, it is starting to get known out there. Like I said, when I first went out, my very first time I went to DC is with RDLA, where Mary works now. <laughs> um, they, their former um, executive director and founder, Emil, told me that when I got there, it was 2012 was the first time I went there. And he was like, oh, wow, sarcoidosis. You're the very first person I've ever seen come here for sarcoidosis. I was like, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> and I'm like, so yeah. Um, I know what you mean when it says that it's not really heard, but in the nine years that I've had my organization, I could tell you it's been night and day compared to what it was. Like I, Kathleen and I work for work with Sarkadosis of Long Island. Um, she's my vice president. I'm the president, and um, we went to a to what was a conference or what? Oh, I don't even know. It was about um, clinical trials, and we um, Kathleen looked it up online. How many were there? And that was just last year. Um, how many were there at that time? You it was over okay? two hundred, I thought. Yeah, and Clin when I clinicaltrials.org, right? Yeah, clinicaltrials.org, and when I looked it up nine years ago, there was there was one with three pending <laughs> that's how many they had at that time <laughs> so they also yeah. have a clinical trial.gov yeah this uh clinical trial and then oh, and there's a couple of places that actually show them around which is cool but yeah they uh so it is doing better we weren't getting one penny from the government when i first that's the first thing Emil told me after he's like heard where I was from. He's like, you know, you don't get one penny from the government. I'm like, not one, not one penny. So now we do. So that's another good thing. So, um, <clears throat> so there are, there are things coming up that, that are actually working and helping. Uh, it's slow process, very slow process. <laughs> But the more of us that speak, the better. Uh, don't be afraid to, like you said, just, even just telling your story to to a friend or to somebody. That's all, that starts everything going. Somebody. Store. Oh. Anyway, Rodney? I said somebody in the grocery store that you meet. Yep. Anywhere. Yeah. Exactly. It doesn't matter just because what one person knows, then it, they'll say, "Hey, have you ever heard of?" Or "Have you?" You know, they start, and it starts going. I have the one thing that I found, like one thing I was doing for a long time, was actually going to shows in New York City, and they were free. And like Mary, you've gone to a couple with us. Kathleen, Regina, did you go? You've been to one. Have you been to one of our, the shows that we went? No. I'm sorry, I missed it. I'm, I'm here making noise. I said, well, you, did you ever go to one of our sh the shows that we went to in New York or no? No. No, okay. Yeah, so we've gone to a couple of shows. But it, the funny thing about that is almost every time I go to a show, there's somebody who says, I know somebody with sarcoidosis. I mean, it is like happening almost every time I go. Because I oh, every time I go to a show, 
I always wear purple. <laughs> I always wear my sock and you know, a Long Island jacket. <laughs> and I, somebody will always come up to me. It's kind of, you know, so it, like I said, it is getting out there. People Frank, are, it seems are, like there's a lot of people in New Jersey and New York City area that know about it. Well, that's because What's of 9-11. New York? Mm -mm. That's because of 9-11. There's a lot of 9-11 first responders that have it. So um, that's why they get a lot of, um, we're getting a lot of people from Long Island, New York City, New Jersey, even Connecticut area now. But um, up by you, Wendy, it's actually, I, I, I don't hear as many, but it, I've he, I'm starting to hear more people up by but when I say up by you, that's anybody who's six hours or more away from me. <laughs> a lot in the South, Fern. Yeah, a lot in the South. Um, Alabama, New Orleans. Um, the Bible. That's all yeah. The, yep. The, the, the Bible Belt is really getting a lot. Um, actually, isn't aren't they like the highest rate? Them out, and then like southeast. Yeah, it might be Frank. Yeah, because I know Georgia has a lot. Yeah, has a lot of. I mean, each like I say, each state. Uh, Trina can tell you about Georgia. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I can definitely tell you about Louisiana. Uh, have people in Mississippi, they don't have a support group in Mississippi, so some come to my support group here in Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That we have in Alabama, Deborah, uh, you know, she could tell. Yeah. There's a lot of patients there. Yeah, there's a lot of patients that, and Florida actually has a lot now, too. Yeah. But also, like, one of the guys that we know, Raul, who was ambassador, um, he was telling me there's a lot of transplants <laughs> that moved down there. <laughs> Snow bunnies, huh? Yeah. <laughs> but now we're not letting them come back here. <laughs> Rodney, why do you think there's so much, excuse me, Rodney, why do you think there's so much down near your area? I think, it, I think it's mostly environmental down here, along with... Uh, genetics also uh, I know several families that that it runs in their families but because of uh you know all the chem plants and all refineries that's down here in this area along the Mississippi River yeah I think that's that's one of the and, and that's then, why New York has a lot too though Along along the, the river in Mississippi, where all these plants are, they're uh, the neighborhoods around them are predominantly African American. So I don't know if that that has something to do with the big number of African Americans in the United States contracting the illness. Not, but I can speak for Louisiana. I can speak on that part. Did I've also heard that a lot of Nurses actually have yeah. sarcoidosis. Nurses, uh, firefighters, let me say, and that was, this was before 9 11. Yeah. You know, uh, it was in the firefighting community. I don't see how the correlation with the nurses. What, what, well, you got there's a lot of chemicals in, in the hospitals. And there's also a lot of sick people in hospitals. <laughs> so, it's like maybe they like had it in their genes, and somebody yeah. had a virus, and they got yeah. sick. Yeah, um, I, it's not proven, but my theory is that you have to have it in your genes because otherwise, everybody at 9/11 would have gotten it, and not everybody got it. So you have to have something in your system first yeah, you for you to have, have it. To be kind of predisposed to. Yeah. To yeah. Get it. I, I had uh, I had an inhalation similar to what the guys got at 9/11, and I was the only person out of 14 people that were there that day that got diagnosed with sarcoidosis. 
I had some other ones that uh, like this one guy, he just kept getting pneumonia every year for seven years, <laughs> you know, in a row. No, that's not that's not normal. <laughs> yeah, I had I had pneumonia. I had pneumonia like for four years right after each other. Mm -hmm. And then you were, you were diagnosed with sarcoidosis. It took forever. As I say, that's not normal to have pneumonia every year like that, year after year. Yeah. After year. So, uh, Mary, Mary, you were gonna say something? Also, do you remember? No, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I didn't want to ask Rodney. Thank you for uh, being a moderator for a rare chat. I hope it went well. That's I was getting ready to ask Frank that I, I wanted to tell you something. Thank you for, for recommending me for, uh, to do that. I wasn't in your room. I was in California's room. I was with, the, not, I was with yeah, the teenagers. I was with the teenagers. No. <laughs> it, it did not go well in the South. <laughs> Did not go well. You know, they they were looking for a couple of hundred people to be in there, and it was only like seven. Ooh. We didn't we didn't even break out into our chat group. Just, oh, I should have joined you all then. Yeah, we could. <laughs> yeah, you could have. I should have joined too because I I was in California and um with what was what's the name of that group the for the the, the young group what's that Dog? yeah they were all they were the oldest person was like 30. <laughs> oh my god that's funny because i was southern california <laughs> so we also had smaller numbers than we expected but we, we it was hard to tell because it was a new format yeah so, right. but i forget how I guess next time. that though but we divided california up and regina were you in a room which room mm -hmm. I didn't tell you. Um, I thought you guys said they were full. Oh. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't that's crazy. Well, I think what happened is once we, uh, you know, people register for stuff and they just don't show up. So we had all these registrants, and then people just didn't quite show up. But I think it, you know, for the people that did go there, I think it went well. But I actually learned a lot from that. The it's there. It, it went very well. I'm sure. I'm sure they were looking at me like, uh, "What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> you don't look. You don't look like a teenager. Huh. I mm. act like it." Hey, can I? Can I say something? Go for it. I want to enlighten everybody and to, to make get. Uh, you know, just let everybody know. Learn how to read your lab reports, mm -hmm. okay? Learn what segmentation rate means. Learn what C-reactive protein means. Learn what lymphocyte, ABS means, okay? And I'm, I'm saying that because I, I always knew what they were and I knew that the segmentation rate and the C-reactive protein rate kind of went hand in hand and let you know when your inflammation levels were up. But I found out yesterday in my doctor's office that the lymphocyte rate also really kind of, you know, tells you that, yeah, you know, something's going on. Now, uh, my rheumatologist yesterday, when we looked back and we followed, you know, we charted reactive proteins, I was normal. And then I just shot up to 12 in about a month and a half. Normal is five. Oh, five. Just I a shot little bit. Up Too 12 and a half. In the next month, I shot up to 25. That was five times what I should have been. That. So he told me, he said, man, he said, and then he looked at my C-reactive proteins followed the same uh, graph, and the lymphocytes followed the same graph. He told me, he said, man, you, it looked like you could have had the Rona. I say, the what? <laughs> <laughs> say, the coronavirus. I say, he said, you had some type of virus. 
Now the only way we can tell is maybe by doing the you know, antibody. Rodney, I can't hear you, and it sounds so, really important. I'm not too, too sure about that, that given treatings or not. Yeah, it did. It did show that I some type of infection. And my primary care doctor, he did catch it, and he put it on. But the reaction I was having from that it made my heart race. I had to get off of that. But I do an antibiotic every day. Uh, I've been doing that ever since I've been on the Remicade infusion, and that's to help me from catching any type of uh, infection. So I. It must have done its job because uh, I took did blood work last Wednesday, and now my numbers are coming back down. So, good. I don't know if I'm a I'm a I'm a, I'm a COVID brother to Frank or not. <laughs> <laughs> that's not one brotherhood we need to be in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good enough, Frank. Mr. Rodney, your 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 rheumatologist told you that you had an infection and explained it to you. Right. Right. It, it wasn't it, like viral. It was uh, like a bacterial. Well, because COVID's viral. Yeah, I mean, he, it, he he didn't distinguish between what kind it was. He said just by those numbers going up like that, it it showed that I had some type of infection. Now by right. me getting, it was getting, probably viral. Yeah, following it up even more. At all, because I I really wasn't sick. Um. The only thing I was having, I was having really bad aches. You know, I was aching and I had a tightness in my chest. That's the reason I was going to the physician, to the doctor. And they did uh, the abs on me, you know, the, uh, tell me out, friend, what you call it? The, uh, uh, the, the lab where they check for everything, the C, 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 uh, the ACE, ACE levels, CBD, CBCs, yeah. CBCs, yeah, CBC. they did that on me, and that's what I did to those numbers, and we, just, we charted it and watched it go up, and then I'm on the way back down now, so hopefully it's going to stay down, but I'm still aching, and I still have it. That's something we're looking at now, trying to figure out what that is. Yeah. Um, when it comes to your blood tests and stuff like that, if you guys don't know, don't be able to, like in that in that same room, you know the Facebook group. You know, if you don't know, ask. Uh, you don't have to be specific. Yeah, even Google. Um, but like Google won't really help you when it comes to sarcoidosis, though. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that really doesn't tell you what the what the numbers mean when it. Or else it tells you you're gonna die in nine years. No, I'm talking about getting um, back and see what the different tests are. Your, oh, your, yeah, yeah. Your protein, yeah. your, your lymphocytes tell you what they are. Yeah, um, but what if you ever have any questions about yeah. about your levels, um, ask in that, in that, um, that closed group, mm -hmm. and if one of us will answer, because... Uh, a lot right. of us know, a lot of us study what they are. <laughs> That's really a lot of time, that. <laughs> everybody's you know level, your 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 normal. Yeah. Normal for me might not be normal for you and mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so, that's why you have to you have you to have take to, a three month, you know, really you really need three tests to really know what you're doing. A lot of times, so, because I, my white blood cells run high no matter what. I mean, I've been high. I can't even remember. It's been probably about seven years. I mean, that's your that's your white blood cells, Frank. Yeah, yeah, my white blood cell count is real high. And normal people, Frank, not normal. <laughs> <laughs> if your white blood cells are high, that shows a t that you have some type of infection. Yeah. <laughs> my, well, let me tell you, at one point, mine were up to 30,000. You doctors suck. That's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for 
got. Well, Freak, I have the opposite of yours. My white and my red are low, and part of it is because I'm on Remicade. Um, yeah. So it keeps it below my normal numbers right now, and that kind of worries me. But <laughs> my Right? Isn't it good to be below? Like yeah, it should have an average. It means it's so really good. Sad, uh, I mean, you don't want your, your, your blood count too low. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, when you're white, I mean, think about it this way. HIV patients have low white blood cell counts. Um, that, and cancer patients, same thing, have a low white blood cell count because the chemo kills the um the blood. The white, white blood cells first, and then it goes to the red blood cells. But like a, mine right now, my a, average for my white blood cells is still anywhere between fifteen to twenty thousand. <laughs> That's my average now. The normal is about five. <laughs> five thousand. Mine is just below the normal, so. Yeah, mine's about five thousand. Is the normal is a normal high is five thousand. That's the high end of a normal is five thousand. So yeah, I I don't know why I just can't get it get it down there. <laughs> but it's all they're actually happy when it's around when they were at fifteen. My doctor's actually happy with it. <laughs> well, it's like Regina Regina was saying, you know, we all the same medication. Hey. How can you laugh thing. about that? He's he la how do you do that? What else are you gonna do? <laughs> I know, but it's 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 probably good for you to laugh. What am I gonna give up? Nah, sorry. No, never give up. No, never but give I mean, up. But if, you, if you get if you get depressed better. If you get depressed over uh, over every little thing that happens with your body, especially with sarcoidosis, forget it. <laughs> no, I don't mean you being I'd depressed, be but the laughter that you you always find like you're like you would probably be a good comedian. <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just in the way I look at it is, you know, if I don't laugh, you're gonna cry, you know, or. I just, it is, I'm actually, I feel better right now. Like I've been walking without my cane. I've been walking around my block now. And if you looked at my numbers, <laughs> they wouldn't tell you I should be doing what I'm doing, but I feel better now mentally. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to be happy. <laughs> going to keep on walking. So what are you saying, Rodney? Before we leave, because it's like 830 and I wanted to hear what Rodney was going to say real quick. Oh, now we can't hear him. We can't hear you, Rodney. <laughs> I, I was having medication. You can't hear me? Now we can. Hey, can you hear me now? Okay. I can hear when you say that. Regina and I are on the same medication, but you can see. Can you hear me? He's he's going in and out. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Let's say if we mute myself. Regina, maybe you're gonna to have to type him a message. And I For some reason you're breaking in and out, Rodney. You may be experiencing neighborhood problems. You now? Now we can hear you. Oh, he disappeared. Now we lost him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> now we won't get to hear what he had to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. We're going to have to tune oh, in you know to the it is? It's one of the. Yeah, exactly. It's tune in to the <laughs> tune in to the next 
he's talking back oh, in. Yeah, yeah, he's trying to redo himself. <laughs> hey, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, all right. So I was saying that Regina and I are on the same medication. But you, as you can see, it's doing Regina differently than it does me. My, my red blood counts and white blood counts are normal. And Regina's are low. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it affects people in different ways, you know. So that's what you have I was to on I was on Remicade and it never, my, my, it never dropped my white blood cell count. Yeah, I, I've oh, never wow. had a problem with it either. My white and my red both are low, and I asked my doctor about it, and she said it's fine because it's just right up under the line of being normal. Yeah. She said it will do that to you, you know, until your body has like totally adjusted. And I've not been on Remicade for a year yet, so um, they say you'll see in a year how well your body is totally adjusted to it. And then in a year, it'll be in August, and then they're going to be switching me to Inflectra. So I'm like, uh, really? So <laughs> I've been on Remicade for 12 years. So so I'm hoping they don't switch me to that Inflectra, and then my doctor still continues to argue for the Remicade because it's, it's really working. It's doing what it's supposed to do. But, you know, my... My doctor Remicade, says it works the same, Regina. What, the Inflectra? Yes. Well, my doctor said, because there's only been one study on inflammatory for sarcoid, that it's not worth the change for me. And he's well-versed in sarcoid, so uh, he don't want me on it. He wants well, me on Remicade. Who, who you, what are you going to go on it? Your insurance? Exactly. Oh. Yeah, my insurance is only paid. in Remicade. Huh? It's less expensive than Remicade. Yep. <laughs> but I heard it had the same stuff in it, Mike. It's, it's compounded differently. It has the same ingredients, but it's compounded differently. There's only been one study. One study on 26 people, and there's no viability or efficacy behind it. They, 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 and they said that themselves, because I found the research on it. <laughs> that, that, that's no I went for my first infusion. I'll remember what you said. <laughs> I'll be sorry. And I took all the information and I took it all to my doctor, and they keep sending them to to the uh, insurance company and everybody. So I keep getting those three months of Remicade, and they're going to continue to do it. Because they don't want me, my doctor does not want me on Inflectra because he said it's scary. And because I'm doing so well on the Remicade, he don't see that I should be switching over to something else. He doesn't he want that to happen. I don't get any of this from my doctors. I'm just, I don't get nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm ta I talked to my doctor. He's well-versed. He's my dermatologist. Well-versed in skin sark, and he knows what works. And he does his research too, so nah. Yeah, but you know, Regina, uh, none of these drugs are uh, uh, FDA approved for sarcoidosis. I know it, <laughs> <laughs> but not he doesn't uh, does yeah. know that Remicade works. <laughs> yeah, well, Dr. Bobman proved that years ago in Cincinnati. Yeah. You know, when he started using it on his patients. Yep. It still, it still doesn't have that FDA approval. <laughs> exactly. So, they, never, they never did the research protocols. So for whatever reason, you know, and, and they're expensive, but I mean, if you know you have something that's working for, for a particular group of people with, a, with, a, with the same illness, look like they should go on and, and do the research protocols and get that medication approved, just like they're doing now with the stuff for COVID. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, but Remicade is used as a therapy, but it's not completely approved. Am I not correct? No, it, it's not approved. No, it's it's actually it's actually used for rheum um, rheumatology. Yep. That's why wow. I have to go to get it. I couldn't get it any other way, but it had to yeah, go through rheumatology. Yeah. I didn't. And that's what it means. 
Now, your dermatologist prescribed that for you, or he has a rheumatologist do it? My dermatologist. Mm. That must be something different in, uh, in, in our states. Well, because I know they use it for, I know it's a therapy for like psoriasis and different things like that. So, you know, he probably knows how to write it up so that I can get the drugs. <laughs> well, Mary, you, you're in New York, huh, Mary? No. I'm in Maryland. Maryland? Okay. So, I know that in Louisiana, because my pulmonologist tried to uh, take over writing this prescription for me. For Remicade, he couldn't do it. I I, I was with the with the rheumatologist, and they were both at the same clinic. So we ended up had to get a, another rheumatologist in that same room to write the prescription for. Me. Yeah, that's what happened to me because I I go to Cleveland Clinic, and Daniel Carver couldn't write it. So my doctor here in Fort Wayne, my dermatologist, he sent them the total prescription. And so it's routed through my dermatologist here in Fort Wayne. And so my dermatologist, <laughs> I'm serious. It goes from your dermatologist to a rheumatologist and then he from sent my pulmonologist to my dermatologist. Because I don't have any other doctor that deals with sarcoid here in Fort Wayne because I go to Cleveland Clinic. So her dermatologist is your um, dealer. <laughs> <laughs> So Dr. Dr. Cole writes it to your to your dermatologist, and then he, oh, wow. Good. Oh, all right. Well, I hate to do this, but it is eight thirty nine. <laughs> We're having so much fun now. It's seven thirty nine here, Frank. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, Rick will be. Hey, I'll, get a, I'll get a um, email from Rick with the um. He gives he sends the the link for this thing. And on this one, I'll be like, oh, you, you stayed a little bit longer this time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Hey, Kathleen. Yeah, it was great to see you all. Good to see you guys. And the next next meeting is the 16th, just so you guys know. Nice meeting, Keisha. And I will talk to you guys soon. All if you right, have any everybody. questions, you know how to get in touch with me. Good night. Good night. Good night. Is that a doctor or something?